to silent, that would be fantastic. Um, and also, if you were here or at home and feel the urge to tweet or to Facebook or to Instagram, feel free to do so. We are at Avid Reader for 101, so please feel free to tag us. And um, I can get out of the way now and leave you to the wonderful Matthew Condon and Francis Whiting. So Matthew Condon was born in Brisbane and has lived all over the world. And um, he has written many books of fiction, including the wonderful, wonderful La Trout Opera, which is still one of my favourite Australian novels, and um, is the author of the best-selling true crime series, uh, which began with Three Crooked Kings and then went on and on. And there was so much to find out that there were so many books in that series. It's really fantastic. But now we are here to celebrate Brisbane, the reissue of this book about our wonderful, wonderful city. And to speak with him about this, we have Francis Whiting, who is one of Australia's favourite journalists, who um, wrote a column um, for, for the Sunday Mail for more than 20 years. Actually, that was a long time, wasn't it? Um, and who has also written for just about everything else in between. And of course, we are massive fans of her two novels, Walking on Trampolines and The Best Kind of Beautiful. So I'm gonna hand over to the wonderful Francis Whiting now. Welcome. Thank you, Chrissy, and thank you, Avid Reader, and thanks everyone for joining us on this lovely, brizzy evening. My absolute pleasure and delight to be here to chat with my good mate, Matty Condon, a brizzy boy through and through, uh, about his book, Brisbane. Uh, and it's just great that we're in this particular setting to, to have this chat. Matt and I, and I know all of you have been particularly fond also of Avid Reader. Uh, so this uh, book is a part of a series of books that New South uh, commissioned different writers from different states to write about their capital city. And they chose Matthew, Maddie Condon, to write about Brisbane, Mr Brisbane. And uh, Maddie, when they approached you uh, to write about your hometown, what did you think? Did you think it was going to be an easy task? Did it frighten you? Like, what, how did you begin? Good question, Francis. Thank you. Um, <laughs> before we start, I'm, I've got to get this off my chest because I will answer the question. Okay. Um, it's an incredibly emotional night for me to be back in Brisbane, mm. to be driving up the highway, to be having an event at my favourite bookshop, and I can't remember the last time I sat for some reason, the rainforest seems much more lush. It um, it's very Brisbane. I have, apart from my wife, I have two of my favourite women in the world and writers in the world, Francis Whiting and Susan Johnson in the audience. Um, an old colleague, Dennis Atkin, not that he's old, but he's a colleague of long standing. <laughs> so it's just so great to get out of the four walls and to be here. So I'm very, very, very happy to be with you. Apart from that um the gestation of this project so um the wonderful people at new south press had this idea and i thought initially what a fantastic idea that they would nominate and get people to write not a travel memoir or a travel log but a, a semi-personal rendition of each city across australia and they had published um Hobart by Peter Timms, which was, so I was the second cab off the rank. And um, I initially thought, um, Philippa McGuinness, the publisher, she was up here for a Brisbane Writers' Festival and we met and had coffee and she said, look, how would you like to write Brisbane? We're doing a city series. We've done Hobart. Um, we'd like you to do the second volume, which is Brisbane. And I immediately said, of course, uh, you know, I am Brisbane. <laughs> um, born and raised, love my city. Um, there's very little I don't know about Brisbane, Philippa. And um, we secured the deal. <laughs> and then I had to go away and actually write the book. And I swear on my heart that it took me, it was the most difficult project <laughs> I have ever had to to do and it took me seven months to try and work out how to get the crack in the door 
how how do you firstly embrace an entire metropolis with a rich history um how do you you know with honor portray its past and present citizens so it was a huge it grew in my mind to be this gigantic responsibility that you know and god forbid you had you know the likes of david maloof and others in your who had written most brilliantly about Brisbane, Jared Lee and all of those great, Thea Astley and Jessica Anderson. And so you've got these titans that have written extraordinarily about this place. Then is the raft of historians. And we've had a clutch of extraordinary historians that have documented the city. So when, when I started to think about it, it became incredibly daunting and I could not think of a way into the story. And at that time I had young children. So my son was about three, three and a half. And um, my daughter had just been born. And uh, I just thought, well, in the spirit of my children, um, X marks the spot, I should go to X. And I chose the obelisk at North Quay as the X, where that, uh, that incredibly uh, dreary monument <laughs> proclaims very boldly, you know, here, John Oxley, um, you know, looking for water in 1823, and thus the city, the, well, European city was born. So I thought X marks the spot. I can't think of anything else. So I'll just grab a notebook and a pen and a camera and I went down to North Quay and I studied that extraordinarily dreary obelisk. And I was up on the street there, but it's hard to see now that obelisk. Sadly, it's covered in pollution and cast exhaust soot and, and it's sort of hidden behind trees. And, um, but I went down to the bike paths below the obelisk and you could look up and there are sort of substantial a pipe system coming out from under the obelisk. And then it occurred to me that it was on a very sheer cliff, that the obelisk was at the top of this quite severe um, um, cliff situation where I thought, what self-respecting explorer like John Oxley would row up the Brisbane River and instead of hopping out of his boat at William Street, why would he go another 150 metres and clamber up 120 metres and plant the flag where the obelisk was? It made no sense to me. So I, I then grew suspicious of the obelisk. So X marks the spot. I went away and I said, I'm going to investigate everything about that monument. Who made the decision to put it there? Was it in the right position? What the hell went on with the obelisk? And that was the crack in the door that allowed me into the story. And thus, um, I discovered that <laughs> there was a peculiar character behind the obelisk, which was erected, it was about four years late, but it was supposed to be erected for this centenary of Oxley yes. landing ashore in Brisbane in 1823, 1923. Uh, but there was a particular character behind the um, nomination, the, the, the um, gathering of money to pay for the obelisk, the location of the obelisk and the wording on that terribly dreary plaque. And that was a, a historian called F.W.S. Cumbrae hyphen Stewart. And I thought, who is this man, F.W.S. Cumbrae Stewart with the most extraordinary name? So another door opened and I investigated him and discovered that um, he had been a criminal barrister in Melbourne. His name was Frank Stewart. And a mate of his had, had come to Brisbane and was one of the founding figures at the University of Queensland and had invited Frank, his good friend, to come and join the staff of the university. And Frank, when he came to Brisbane, uh, suddenly developed this extraordinary affectation 
<laughs> and decided it's a very Brisbane story he, isn't he it? decided for corruption what, what was <laughs> not, not at all what was interesting about Frank was that he gave away the law he was a criminal yeah. um, defense lawyer he gave away the law because he didn't like mixing with riffraff which I thought would not be helpful for a criminal defense lawyer so he comes to Brisbane and reinvents himself completely as FWS Cumbrae Stewart he believes he's descended from Robert the Bruce and he becomes this historian in Brisbane and cajoles his way into the good graces of the governor and uh, all sorts of public figures, has a radio show, a column in the newspapers, and he was a total fraud. And what he got wrong with the monument was he misread Oxley's field journals and he was out by about 800 metres. But that's another story. <laughs> and again, Lily, I have to say, I just think that's such a Brisbane story. And we are, of course, um, talking about European settlement of Brisbane. Uh, so all the stories that have made this town what it is, and it's, it's such a, I find Brisbane such a fascinating town. Um, but let's talk a little bit now about your own story coming to Brisbane. How did you come to call Brisbane your hometown? Okay, well, um, on, on my father's side, the, the, the fighting Irish came out and settled in Gympie and ended up in Brisbane. And my dear grandmother migrated with her family um, from Reading in England and arrived here in Brisbane in 1925 um, when she was um, a young girl. So um, it's interesting old Brisbane where that, that entire family, um, of my grandmother's family, so she had two sisters and two brothers, and um, all of them except one sister ended up living in the same street. So you'd have my grandmother on at 120 Beck Street, and her brother was over the, over the road, and her other brother was over the road. So they sort of, they weren't far away from each other to help and assist and see each other through. It was nice, these sort of little mini villages where, where they settled. And I don't, I'm sure that wasn't um, <clears throat> uncommon. Um, my dear grandmother who died in the 1990s, she, <laughs> um, she was very English. I'm not saying that she was upper class English. My family was entirely working class. My grandmother worked um, cleaning she was a cleaner for the wealthy ladies of Brisbane to clean their houses. My grandfather was a, a sign rider and a motorcycle enthusiast and in, invented a fiberglass um, motorcycle helmet in the 1950s, which he called the skid lid. He had no money for a patent. But he was one of the so first. You're not heir to this no, no, no. But my grandmother, who cleaned the houses of the wealthy ladies of Brisbane, um, she told me this story once of this woman um, that gave her for Christmas, gave her a Christmas present, and she gave her one of her discarded um, fox furs, and she handed it to my grandmother, and my grandmother said. Um, where would you expect I would wear that? <laughs> and it was a very, very telling moment, you know, for me yeah. as a young person to hear that story. Um, and my grandmother, when she died in the 1990s, I was by her bedside when she died and <laughs> I was holding her hand and I said, I said, Gran, um, um, what have you thought of Brisbane? So she came from Reading, like when she was 12 how has Brisbane been for you? And she said, I have loathed every minute of it. <laughs> because she still, she suffered from the heat, even when she was in her 80s. And it was just like, you know, what is this place? It's so aggressive. And, you know, yeah. it was, she never put some, put roots down. You know, it was impossible. She was an exotic plant that had no place in this soil. But so, um, I, I, of course, was born in Brisbane and um, we left, the family left when I was about 14. We went to the Gold Coast for dad's um, work. Um, I hated the Gold Coast. Absolutely. It was like another, no, it, it was like a loathed. It was like another country. I went to uh, Aquinas College. I was the only boy 
in the entire school. I went in winter with long pants. And I was reading a book at lunchtime and I would have these kids come and say, what are you doing? It's like, what, what, what's that? And I said, well, I'm reading a book, you know. And it was the first and only place I ever got the strap. I got the strap, three of the best for a late library book. Oh, so it's yeah, so sort of, that, yes. says a lot about the Gold Coast culture. It's all about you too. <laughs> but came back and settled here and then um, in the 80s. During, so what suburb are we talking? Then? Well, Something we lived in a, well, the gap, the gap at that time was the sort of western frontier of Brisbane suburbia. My parents bought this piece of land in, a, in this housing estate, which was literally you know, Mount, the, the forests of Mount Coother were over there and there were dairy farms over there. And this is 1962. So um, it was on the edge of the metropolis then. And, and Maddie, you know, I'm a Brizzy girl too, by the way, born and bred. Uh, I come from Indrapilly. Um, so we grew up there and Matt and I have spoken about this often. Um, well, not often, that's a lot. We've spoken about it now and again, uh, which is, you know, these days, uh, there's a certain fondness that we both have for Brisbane, and we both love it dearly, as do many other people. You know, we call it Brisney land and Bris Vegas, and there's a, a certain uh, fondness that we all have for it. But for me, particularly during my early 20s, and for most of the people I know, um, there is always a period of disenchantment with Brisbane. Um, did you have that period of disenchantment too? And where did it take you? And then we ask a second part of the question is, what called you back? Okay, we got two hours. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so in for the night. <laughs> I was interviewed yesterday by a journalist in Sydney about this book. And he mentioned and perpetuated the story of, well, Brisbane's a small country town, it's really boring and nothing happens there and there's no culture and they don't. And I thought, hang on. Yeah, I remember that from the 80s and the 70s and the 80s. Uh, and hopefully we'll talk about this later. It is totally the opposite today, but let's discuss that. But it's still held in the heads of people in Sydney and Melbourne that Brisbane is this sort of fossilised nightmare, uh, when in fact it's, it's probably one of the most progressive modern cities in this country and we can discuss that with great pride and fly flags and do whatever we have to do but um i never actually felt disenchanted and that it was a boring place really but in the 80s there were a number of contributing factors that led to me and there were many many of us that sort of fled south and that was one was the unending um, political nightmare of um, the Bjorki Peterson era. Yeah. Um, I don't want to get too political, but it was, you know, it dragged on to the point where when we were in our early 20s, mid 20s, we were thinking, um, this is never going to change. Um, it's intolerant. Uh, what do we do? What do we do? and many of us left. I left too for a number of reasons. One being that I, I actually was a police roundsman on the Sunday Mail. I wrote a page one story about um, the traffic branch falsifying um, data and statistics in relation to the first random rat testing trials. And this had been, uh, the police said this had been going on for six months and the numbers were phenomenal and they arrested hundreds of people and tested thousands of people. And a guy in the traffic branch rang me and leaked information to me that it was all false, that hadn't done a single test. <laughs> and I wrote this story and the head of the traffic branch, a guy called Cal Farah, who was ultimately uh, and completely pummeled by the Fitzgerald inquiry, um, he didn't like me after that. He rang me at home, I don't know how he got my number, and said, I thought we were friends. And I said, what do you mean I've never met you? And uh, for about four weeks after that, I would go out to my car to go to work. All the tires were slashed. I'd be pulled over relentlessly by undercover police officers checking indicators and trying to find something with the vehicle. It was just harassment. And I thought, 
what's the point? So, and I'd wanted to give, try my hand in Sydney, you know, in those days we thought, oh, well, if you, if you can make it in Sydney, we can make it anywhere. So I did that. And that kept me away for 20 years. Um, and I did various things and lived around the world and bits and pieces and wrote books and all of that. But um, to answer the second part of your question, um, I was back in Sydney and I had met my wife and she fell pregnant and I went, oh shit, um, I have to get serious here. <laughs> I have to get a proper job and, and look after my family. So um, I came to Brisbane and I spoke to, you'll remember David Fagan, yes. whom I knew as a business journalist in the eighties. And I, I met him for coffee down at James Street. And I said, David, I'm appealing to you. Um, I want to come back to Brisbane and I want to, I need a job. And he gave me a job um, for which I will always be grateful. And um, I raised my family and now I have three kids. So in many ways too, I look maybe ridiculously nostalgically at Brisbane in, in that it gave me my family. I, I can't imagine raising those three children in Sydney or elsewhere. And that's I think, what I think drew it's me a back. real truism of Brisbane that um, often the very things that help drive us away from Brisbane are the very things that bring us back here. Um, and there is, I think, whilst it's certainly not the big country town, I hate that tag also, there is a sense of a more solid, stable, slower place to be a family here, I think. Uh, and like you, I've had my time away and come back. And you mention it here on the back, I'm going to read it. And one of the things that brings me back to Brisbane and that I do love about our town um, is the light. And I just want to read this if I may, Maddie. Um, I keep coming back to the light of Brisbane. If you were born into it, this palette of gentle pinks and oranges at dawn and dusk, the blast white of midday in summer, the lemon luminescence of mid-morning and mid-afternoon, you keep it with you and measure all other light by it. If you live away from it, then step back into it. It is the first thing that tells you that you're home. It's so good, may well, I say, I, but it's so true. You. But I think that's, that is very true. And I was asked this question yesterday, well, what are, you, what are you talking about the light? And I said, well, you can't understand it unless you've lived here. You can't understand standing, for example, in Given Terrace, at 4.35 on a February afternoon and you see the black and green clouds yes. coming over and the storm is on its way. Yes. Everything changes, the birds are going crazy, the dogs are barking, you can smell the soil and you know in 20 minutes that you're gonna be pummeled yes. with a, a rainstorm. This is Brisbane, it's like, it is very tactile. My childhood, your childhood was very, very yes. tactile was always outside. It was always playing in creeks, penny turtles up in the bush. Yeah. It was it was engagement with our extraordinary environment. And you knew that if you didn't do the gardening, that within about four and a half hours, your house would be taken over by vines. <laughs> uh, it, it, that, you know, you have, you're fighting, you're constantly fighting um, back this extraordinary and relentless the bats, environment. The bats, and the bats coming bats, over. The bats. I, I had a great conversation actually for this book. It was very un weird and curious conversation, but um, I was so annoyed with the brush turkeys oh, yeah. around the house and yeah. constantly destroying everything. And I wanted to know about these brush turkeys because John Oxley, wrote, when he came in 800 metres from where FWS Cumbria Stewart yeah. said he came in <laughs> up, up near, you remember that? Drift restaurant, which really Absolutely. lived, well, lived Absolutely. up to its name during Absolutely. the flood, during the drift. I did a story on it just the after drift. it drifted down the river. <laughs> well, just there uh, on the bike walkway, there, there's a canal that you can go under, you can walk under, and that's the that was called the Old Western Creek. Yes. And that creek went through Frew Park yes. and the back of the Milton State School. That's Oxley landed near there. and. 
he camped on that side of the Great Western Creek and on the other side was an indigenous camp and they were very cautious and worried. But that's where Oxley came in and Oxley came in up, up through um, what is, we now know as, well, it was Rosalie, but it's Paddington. And he came up to the foot of the back of Government House there at the back, Elizabeth Street at the back there and saw this wonderful chain of ponds now, this is where Cumbrae Stewart got it wrong. He thought the chain of ponds, which was in fact a bit of a swamp down near in front of where the city hall is now, he confused the chain of ponds with that. But the chain of ponds, and it's absolutely fascinating, during heavy rain in Brisbane to this day, if you go out after a heavy downpour to the foot of, gov of the grounds of Government House, you can actually still see the chain of ponds. It's like half a dozen water gatherings that's what Oxley saw when he and he was he was going to put the city where Rosalie is um initially um it's funny you know all these Brisbane stories just prompted a memory for me uh growing up in Brisbane you know outside government house they have the, the little century it's like a white it's a very small building it's got the visitors book in it my dad always used to tell me that that's where the Queen lived. And that if you signed your name in the visitors book one day, you would get a summons from the Queen. So I did sign my name in that book and she never called me. <laughs> um, do you have, Maddie, a, a, a quintessential uh, Brisbane memory, feeling, scene? You know, for some people, you know, it's the convoluted roofs over scattered over Red Hill for other people. It's the Jacarandas and New Farm Park. Um, do you have a standout when you think of Brisbane? I have a couple, mm. actually. Um, I don't know what it is about being born and bred in Brisbane, whether we are injected in our DNA with this sort of potential hyper romanticism Absolutely. in terms of place, um, whether we lean towards um, hyperbole and exaggeration. I don't know what it is, but there is something about this place that that and the attachment to this place that is powerful and different from people, for example, that are born and bred in Sydney or Melbourne, etc. But on mass, I'm, I'm speaking generalistically here. There's something about the call of Brisbane um, that is so extraordinarily powerful. Now, that period when I was at that little, tiny little house at the Gap in Banara Street, the Gap, where I could drive there tonight and 75% of the people that were my neighbours when I was five are still there. That is extraordinary. It's extraordinary. It is driving back through time. So there is that place, which is a very, very special place. My, you know, those years were very were you, wonderful. Have you done the very Brisbane thing of revisiting that place? Oh my going back God. with your kids. This I can't is where count. I grew up. I can't count. I'll come to that. Yeah. Um, the second is my grandmother's house in Beck Street, Rosalie which she was very, very important to, to me and my life. My grandfather died when I was um, nine months old. Uh, he was a card carrying member of the Communist Party. And he was told he would never, ever get a job, ever, a regular job, ever in Brisbane. And that's exactly what happened. So he ended up repairing toasters and irons for the people in the suburb working under the house. And, you know, it was a very impoverished existence um but you know he was a man of you know powerful beliefs and he suffered for it paid for it um and i admire that but that place in in beck street um is a is totemic for me in many ways but in banara street for example the funny thing is how life works out when i was a child in banara street um you'd ride your dragsters you know around yeah. the streets and in the parallel the seat. with the purple, I, mine was burnt orange. And in the parallel street, 
I used to, um, I've written about this, I used to ride down there and there was this house. It was a very average house. And, but what was alarming about it was that it had these gigantic cactuses. Like it was very aggressive house. It was like these 20 foot cactuses with big spikes out the front. But there was always a, this sort of polished black limousine parked out the front with a gentleman wearing a cap, like a proper limousine driver which as you can imagine for a kid in the 60s was very, it was shocking. In a gap. And in the gap. And it turned out later, I discovered that, that in that house lived the then police commissioner, Frank Bischoff. <laughs> now, uh, 40 years later, I would expose him as a pedophile. And I lived in the street behind him as a child. So Brisbane, you know, has its little... These Brisbane stories is quite amazing, isn't it? The story now, my grandmother's story. house in Beck Street behind that was Elizabeth Street. During the great floods of 1974, my parents lived, we were living in Samford and the creeks rose and we got cut off from our parents. So my sister and I stayed with our grandmother while they were trapped at Samford. Now, during that exact period in late January 1974, literally in the street behind 100 metres down the road was a block of flats. And in that flat lived the gangster Vincent O'Dempsey. And during that period of the floods, he had murdered Barbara McCulkin and her two daughters. And I was a street away with my grandmother. And I would go on to write about that and do a podcast about that. So um, in his current um, podcast, which is excellent if you haven't heard it. The connections are so very Brisbane, oh, I think. And you and in Brisbane you don't have too, to kind of exactly. hand out far, do you? You don't. You don't to touch the past in this city, it's not a big effort. It's it's there. And I think that's very uh, it's frightening and attractive. Um, Maddie, you're quite right. I, I feel it, as you know, I'm very sentimental about this place as well. There is a sentimentality attached to Brisbane if you grew up here, I believe. Um, but the darker side of Brisbane, the underbelly of Brisbane is also something that you've explored extensively through your books and journalism and now your podcast. Um, has that tainted Brisbane for you? Has it tainted that sentimentality, knowing that, you know, beyond the beautiful creeks and the gap and the gorgeous light, there's all sorts of not so beautiful things that have happened in the city? No, it hasn't tainted it one, one iota. In fact, it's enriched the city for me. You know, we would be naive to think that Brisbane was all about the Salvation Army playing in front of City Hall in 1971 and um, onward Christian soldiers with the Premier. And this is, you know, th there was a very, very real and extremely dangerous subculture that was happening. Why wouldn't it? It was happening everywhere else in this city. And certainly in, in Brisbane in the 1970s, uh, this was about as dangerous a place as you could find in this country um, with, with, a, with a number of individuals that were as violent as anyone that this country's ever produced. So um, you have the 1973 Whiskey A Go Go atrocity, which is people were still trying to work out what happened after, you know, 50 years. So, uh, and that inquest should be coming up soon. But this, this, was a very, this has been a very violent place and I can't help but think it goes back to our origins as an extremely violent um, penal colony and that things are left in the soil, you know, they just are. And, um, but I find that alluring and, and attractive and uh, again, you're constantly, um, constantly confronted with People from Sydney saying, well, our gangsters are better than your gangsters. <laughs> Melbourne, you know, we've got the gangland wars. Um, and of course, you know, in Brisbane, it's just, you know, petty thieves. We had the most violent people, killers, so murderers here that you can imagine. So I've, I've, it's been an exhausting journey to uncover that. But what it has given me is an, a, an added appreciation in terms of I can drive anywhere in this city and I can go, I know what happened in that house. I know what happened in the bottom of that building. Um, it's just, that's just knowledge that gives you a richer appreciation of the landscape, I think. So you share an intimacy with this town. 
um, perhaps more so than some of us who live here. As you say, you kind of do know most of its nooks and crannies and where, where the bodies are buried. Um, just touching on something that we spoke about earlier and this idea of Melbourne, Sydney, Brisbane, you know, they say, well, they used to say, um, let me see if I can get this right. In Melbourne, they ask you where you live. In Sydney, they, in Sydney, they ask you where you work or how much you earn. But in Brisbane, they ask you, what school did you go to? Um, there's still that. So do you think that Brisbane in the 21st century, Maddie, is still that kind of way? Well, there are, there's a persistent um, strand of that. And you see it, I think it was last week in the Career Mail, page one about someone from, is it PMS? What's that? Is that, is that something to do with schools? Premenstrual stress. <laughs> <laughs> and some scandal about a woman who pretended that she was a Logan Bogan or something and typed it in social media. And it's all schools, you know, all the schools. Of course, it's still, but it's only a, I think it's a diminishing return with the schools. Um, and I think that's, you know, something that, that was very, very true. And I'm sure it persists. And I'm sure that there are great connections made between, uh, I always said that those fantastic uh, and incredibly expensive private schools in um, wherever just produce a better quality of drug dealer. <laughs> it's just <laughs> with better manners, you know. What's the difference? But I think it does persist. But I think it's dying out because, and it has to die out because the demographics of this city are unrecognizable from, for example, the 80s when I left. Um, everything has changed, extraordinarily cosmopolitan. Um, that feeds into culture, food, everything, <coughs> and it changes um, the texture um, of a city. Speaking of change, Maddie, with this book, there's an, a new epilogue um, with, this, with this issue. So what is the new part and why did you decide that you needed to revisit? Well, the publishers decided oh, okay. that I needed <laughs> an epilogue. But as it, as it turned out, and we did, let's go back to this because you asked that question earlier. And in fact, I know you have an incredible story you told me. We've got plenty of time, which is great. You told me an amazing story about revisiting your childhood home. So I, want, I would love you to relay that. But I've been back to that house in Banara Street a thousand times. I've cruised past it early morning, late evening, checking the light of the houses, trying to match it to my memory as a child, um, trying to get every perspective of the day, the trees, the shade. And um, a couple of years back, uh, um, my wife was working and I had the children, the three children, and they said, what are we going to do, Dan? And I said, let's go and see the house again. And I went, oh, my God. <laughs> Not again, Dan. <laughs> Not again. And it was really hot. And I said, like no, I said, it'll be fun and we'll have lunch afterwards. And <laughs> so we drove I'll take out. you to the gap tavern. <laughs> <laughs> so out we drove and unbelievably, there was a sandwich board on the footpath open for inspection. Wow. I thought, okay, I left this house in 1973 and it's now 2019. And I said to the kids, I pulled over <laughs> and said, stay in the car. I'll leave the air conditioning on. That's cool. You can go on your iPads. Oh, fantastic. I said, I'll be back in 10 minutes. So I went I'll be back in 10 lifetimes. <laughs> so as it turned out, I found out from the real estate agent, the woman that bought the property from my parents had lived there and she was selling it. So it was only one owner removed from when I was living in there. And I had this great fear. I, was, I went up the stairs, it's like this sort of faux colonial, tiny little three bedroom yeah. place and with a double garage downstairs. And I went up to the veranda at the front and I had this fear that if I stepped through the threshold of that door, my entire childhood would, memories of it would collapse, that I would be confronting this thing, that, this place that I had mythologized since I was 12, 
the minute I was stepped through that frame, everything would evaporate. That was my ridiculous fear. But I, I went in, it was a bizarre sort of Catholic shrine in the left-hand corner that was like illuminated saints and it was quite unusual. But, and of course the house seemed extraordinarily small, but I remembered it and the hallway and the bathroom and my room, there was my tiny little room where I'd lain in that bed and looked at the moon through the window and, um, you know, you dream your dreams. And out the back was this, uh, <laughs> my father had, had built a brick barbecue in like 1972. And now it was just, it was still there, but it was like this Aztecian ruin. <laughs> and, the hot plate the woman had pot plants on it and it was just like you know 40 plus 50 years later and um but it was an extraordinary experience to be back so i went i stood on that veranda i looked out and i recognized the view you know it's imprinted and i went downstairs and i poked my head into the garage where I spent a lot of time under the house in the dirt, you know, yeah. playing cars. And yeah. as, as I relay in the book, I built a replica of the CBD yeah. and yeah. Um, did a road all the way out to Debra and <laughs> Redcliffe. And, yeah. um, and I looked up at, and the timber struts of the house, there was on, on one of the struts as if it was written yesterday in chalk was Condon job mm -hmm. and a boot print the end of that and I stared at that I thought, what is that what do they mean Condon job mm. and it was obviously when my parents built the house it was the timber merchants yeah. Yeah. that had piled the wood on the truck and gone Condon job yeah. and sent it out and there it was still there Eer it was eerie it was utterly eerie and um, I've never been back since Um, Can right. you just please tell your story because it's amazing into the Yindrapilly house. All right, very quickly. Um, when Matt and I were talking yesterday about our childhood in Brisbane, I told him that I too am a sentimental creature and we grew up at 34 Clarence Road in Drapilly and we were there for um, 34 years till my father got Alzheimer's and we had to move. Um, anyway, my mum has stayed on in the house for some time afterwards and eventually, because it was a big old Queenslander, it was too big for her, so we had to move. And 34 Clarence Road had two ladder stores, uh, wooden ladder stores, and everyone, my family, the neighbourhood kids, Anyone who'd ever been there knew that to break into our house, for whatever reason, if you needed to get in, you just had to stick your finger through the door and through one of the little squares and, and it would open the door. So and thus it was that our front doors were perfect except for one little square that had a, a curved circle from thousands and thousands of fingers wearing it down for over the years. When we sold that house, me being a sentimental creature too, uh, I could not let it go. So for an inordinately long period afterwards, while it was still for sale and then being um, done up, I would drive over there and break in, <laughs> put my finger through the door, open up the door, and I would just walk around my empty house, my childhood house, and I would just spend time in the rooms and uh, I would touch the walls and sometimes I'd just sit and this went on for far too long that was mentally healthy I think and then one day I went back there and I stuck my finger and I changed the lock and that's how I knew like when you saw the joinery sign that's how I knew my childhood was over. Anyway, 
we'd love uh, if you have some questions um, for Matt or any of your own Brisbane uh, stories that we would love for you to share with us. Uh, so I'm going to open it up now to the audience. Uh, if anyone would like to ask uh, Matt a question about the book Brisbane or indeed anything at all about his writing or his growing up experiences here. Yes. Um, I, look, I just have to share um, that thing about the different capital cities because my aunt was born in 1921 and her take on it was that if you were born in Adelaide, they said, what church did you go to? If you were born in Melbourne, what school did you go to? If you were born in Sydney, how much did you earn? If you were born in Brisbane, what do you drink? <laughs> I, I think I love that. It, I wanted to talk about how much it has changed. Um, yes, we there, there was on. an invisible line this city crossed. I can't put a definite date on it. Um, but there was a point this city crossed where we turned our back on Sydney and Melbourne and decided to go our own way. They can't comprehend that, but, and I think we're now looking in other directions. We're looking to Asia, we're looking elsewhere, but there is a confidence in this city and it just appeared. It took a long time, but it just appeared. It's a, an incredibly interesting city. It's diverse. The food is incredible. The culture is incredible. Um, and we own it and it's ours and the rest of them can get stuffed. I would agree. I think for far too long, we were very apologetic about it. Um, yes. Thanks, Matt. Um, you mentioned earlier about literary giants like Maloof, Pierre Astley, Gerard Lee. Um, how did you sort of find a, a place among those to be able to talk? That's a great question. And I love your Led Zeppelin t shirt. And it's making me nostalgic in another way, but um, I may collapse off this stool with too much nostalgia. Um, Jared Lee was incredibly important to me when I was a young writer, and Thea Astley and, and Maloof, but those two for two great reasons. Thea yeah, Astley for me. Um, they showed to me that you could write about Brisbane, you could write about Brisbane and the world at the same time. And that changed, that gave me a confidence that allowed me a path through. Um, so I felt very lucky and privileged that I could have read them. I mean, Jared Lee's book, True Love and How to Get It, which I think is out of print, but that really was an extraordinary work for me. And I just, it just hit me like a ton of bricks. And I went, wow, you can, you can write about your own experience in our city. That is incredible. And that changed everything for me. And I was very lucky to uh, to get to know Thea Astley um, later in life. And what an extraordinary, extraordinary writer she was and is. And of course, David. So we've had Titanic writers write about this city and they keep coming. Um, but I can only say that, you know, if I hadn't received that confidence from those, from other writers, you, you know, you claw on their shoulders and then you, you try and go your own way. Um, but their importance is, is immeasurable. And you try and find your own path. You, you know, how could you replicate Maloof or Astley or it's impossible, the, the uniqueness of their voices. Um, and you try and find your way around the, the subjects and tropes that they have immortalized and Maloof. What I love about 12 Edmondson Street is that the Stefan Sky Needle is exactly where 12 Edmondson Street is. So in a bizarre way, you just have to look at Stefan's Needle and go, well, that's where Maloof's classic was based, you know. That's the oddness of Brisbane, that you could have that no extraordinary juxtaposition. No Stephen. other city could produce that. Um, but um, Brisbane uniquely during that period under uh, difficult political um, conditions where culture was not encouraged, was not applauded or celebrated, you, you look and find your own champions and Lee was one for me and, and of course Maloof and others and you hold your breath and hope to make your way through. Ah, uh, yes. 
as a Southside person, reading the book, I found like there's still the big divide between the South Side oh, yeah. and the North Side. Yeah. And I can remember when I grew up the same age as you know, similar to you are. The school situation, I went to Cleveland High School and I had to go for the public speaking at, Senate, at All Hallows yeah. and being told, oh my God, you're at the wrong school. You know, you, you know, come to our school because yeah. it's better, it's on the other side of the river. Yeah. That was funny. And my husband is from the north side. Yeah. And after 20 years of living back in Brisbane, after going and coming back, I finally had to get him to come to the south side to live <laughs> because you just can't take the south side you know so it's a different dichotomy of growing up yeah like what you say in your book is your side from my side is brisbane had morningside had dirt roads when i was little and you're not so that old i'm <laughs> older than you um, but there was actually dirt roads and the south side it was so different and even it took to expo to sort of make the south side grow up so i always think that my brisbane's different to your brisbane i think that is such an incredibly interesting point yeah, yeah. and I, i'm not sure whether the south side north side even though occasionally oh, at, every five years sorry, you'll get is. you'll get a piece in the sunday mail about the north side and the south side <laughs> um, and the great debate but I don't, I don't think there's been enough perhaps serious attention paid to that's fascinating it's absolutely fascinating. You're absolutely right. How dare you traitorously marry a North Sider? <laughs> Is he here or? No, he's not here. <laughs> but yeah, it was, it was you know, his idea. He hadn't, we, we didn't go across, we didn't come across the river for like 10 years. <laughs> ten I totally years. agree. Yeah, <laughs> 10 years. Totally years agree. So, it's still I'm a Western Suburbs girl and I married a North Side boy and it's yeah. been difficult. <laughs> <laughs> My wife's from Sydney, so I don't have any of this crap. <laughs> I think we've got time for one more question. Yes. Yeah, Very I, quick. Um, I, I had an uncle who was a um, police officer from probably about 88 uh, through to about 2005 and he always quotes that he was able to rise through the ranks so quickly because there was no one left. <laughs> 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 so it was the fire, there was just detectives on mass were, were all of the rest of it. You know, he just talks about what he experienced. But then when you speak to my grandparents, one of their crowning joys about their house in Cleveland was that they lived next door to the Oki Peterson's <laughs> and what a great man he was. Did you find that there was a, I guess, a shift culturally where you know, people like yourself were experiencing the harassment during the 80s and I hear, you know, stories of, of you know, friends' dads saying that they used to get beaten up by police and having long hair. And then people that were in my grandparents' generation where they thought the Oki Peterson was just the, the, the best thing, you know, to, to happen in Queensland. Wow, what a time to open a debate like that. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, oh, my God. Um, in the 1950s, there was a squad formed called the Bodgy Squad. And that went right through to the 80s. That was your people with long hair. Yeah. And they were just plucked off the street if they looked different. Um, that's the sort of city I lived in. And um, I won't go down the path of, of politics, but, um, you know, this place, this state, this city has changed because um, as, as time as it does um, removes generations of memory and we're further and further and further away from an intolerant period in our history and life becomes more tolerant and easier if i can say that and it's because the prejudices vanish and new people arrive and we all try to get along so uh, it was a very very difficult period for an enormous number of people um, great people lost their lives for trying to tell the truth, lost their lives and, and paid the ultimate price in Queensland, in our so-called civilized state. Um, it's all, it's really all I can say without going off for the next two hours about you know what I've learned and what I know. Uh, but 
let's just say we're far better off today than we were then. And on that hopeful note, uh, I think we'll conclude the evening and thank you so much, um, Maddie. Always thank you. Thanks, Chrissy. Thanks, Chrissy. Thanks, Chrissy. Thanks, Chrissy. I'm just going to sneak in um, and I wanted to talk about a special project that um, Avid Reader has been involved in and that's the Chrysalis Project 4101 and we're working with the highly esteemed um, Indigenous artist Vernon R. Key and we're looking at wrapping the outside of um, the building, so it's the first floor up and around, um, with um, words and with authors' names. So it's called um, Word Up. And what we'll be doing is featuring Brisbane authors and overlaying those names with Indigenous authors. And so Vernon's um, concept is uh, see their names, say their names. And I thought it was a very appropriate thing to do, not just because of the audience that we have this evening, but with what you were saying, Matt, with in terms of um, Brisbane authors, but also West End has a very strong connection, including Jared Lee. And, and so what we thought, that this is what we've come up with. This is what Vernon is doing. Um, it's part of a project called Chrysalis, and that's about um, philanthropic-led community, artist-led economic stimulus. So if you want to know more about it, uh, there's we've got information at the counter and, and then also at the front of the shop. It's tremendously exciting. Chrissy has had a sneaky look into it. Um, Matt and Francis and also Susan, they don't quite know about it yet, but I think people will be really excited. This is um, not just Australia, not, this will put um, West End and Boundary Street not just on the Australian map but the international map in terms of public art and we're very thrilled, very excited to be part of it and we encourage um, people to know about it, talk about it and also where possible to donate to it. Um, it, even small amounts will make a really big difference to get a very exciting project up. Um, we're thrilled to be part of it. Thank and I think, I think it's really important um, to to follow that up with the, the fact that um, we are having, you know, the names of, of um, Brisbane-based artists that are connected to place and connected to this shop in particular, which has been such a meeting ground for so many amazing writers over the years. And to have um, the two of you, Francis and Matt, here on stage, because you have been a massive part of our literary history. And then and to have Susan Johnson finally back in the country and in the audience. We have missed you so much, Susan. Thank Thank you for coming here as soon as you come back to Brisbane. Um, and it's it's just wonderful to know that um, one of the things about Brisbane is that it's such a collegial place for writers and the difference between, um, you know, Melbourne and Sydney and Brisbane is that we are absolutely all full of love for each other and I loved listening to you two today and thank you for coming to Avid. Thank you. Remember, if you're on Zoom, um, you can call up 0738463422 if you want a personal um, uh, signature. Otherwise, you can just get a signed copy. Um, but everyone who's in store at the moment, we are going to reconfigure inside. We're going to get Matt to the first signing table post-COVID. This is the first time we've had a signing post-COVID. Um, and we're going to get... We are. We're going to get Matt there first. So let's... Um, and the bar is open, so you don't have to sit there dry. So um, we'll get men out first, and then um, we'll join them.